423545. No, that's not my contact phone number. It's a little puzzle someone gave the stenographer, poet and religious seeker, John Byram in 1735. Byram boasted, if he knew just the number of letters for each word in a sentence, he could work it out. And he did. Can you? The solution's coming up later. This challenge happened during a convivial tavern evening where half of the 14 men round the table knew Byram's shorthand. And for me, it encapsulates something I hope it's useful to highlight today. Recovering a sociability in deciphering. Byram developed his shorthand in the late 1710s, fine tuning it over the next 30 years, but it didn't get into print until after his death in this 1767 manual. In his lifetime, he'd aimed it particularly at young lawyers and undergraduates who paid a princely five guineas to learn it, either from him personally or one of his loyal network of teachers. So far, I've traced over 300 men and women and a few children who knew it while still unpublished, from the highly eminent to the completely obscure. What we might call this scribal community deployed shorthand for numerous purposes like capturing trials, lectures, verses, sermons and conversations, and to transcribe, annotate, interlineate, draft, dock it, commonplace, diarise, and even carve into stone. Dickens scholars shouldn't see Byram as merely antiquated prehistory to what Dickens learned, but rather as a living context. By the 19th century, it was more widespread than ever it was in its inventor's lifetime, particularly in adapted forms. And you could get personal tuition in it in the Lincoln's Inn area in the 1830s. I think the reasons why a system like the Gurney system version Dickens knew supplanted it had less to do with intrinsic technical reasons than external factors like patronage and influence. The fact that unlike Gurney, Byron wasn't able to make his system an official vehicle for institutional memory. Here are three quick 18th century examples. Because this is a symposium to do with Dickens, I thought I'd better start with a novel. Here's a transcription of Smollett, which one Leonard Walker copied out in Manchester in 1764 for his friend Joseph Caldwell, probably designed as an aid to learning. The second two are courtesy of the John Rylands Library. First, a lovely example of shorthand cut into paper by Byram's sister Phoebe. And earlier this year, John Rylands acquired an important manuscript by one of Byram's most famous pupils, Charles Wesley, who, like his brother John, was a skilled user of Byram's shorthand throughout his life. There's still important research to be done on hymn versions like the ones here. We tend to think of shorthand as an interim, discardable, ephemeral, sometimes secretive medium, expecting a rough or hurried ductus in the writing. So examples like these might seem um, surprising, but they're not untypical. This is shorthand that's intended to be read and reread by people besides the original writer. And I hope they highlight there's more to shorthand than mere semantic content and give a sense of what Byram constantly promoted as his system's beauty, arising from the regularity and underlying geometric conception of the symbols, which he contrasted with what he called the awkward, ugly, distorted figures of his rivals. Just as significant was his avoidance of arbitraries or symbolicals, the things that caused David Copperfield's heartbreaking experiences with his despotic characters. Learning Byram didn't require memorizing countless lists of shapes, such as, to quote poor David, the beginning of a cobweb, meaning expectation, or a pen and ink skyrocket, standing for disadvantageous. It's easier to learn, use and read than a system like Gurney's. But that's not to say it never poses difficulties or puzzles. Far from it. Byron was something of a pioneer of the shorthand correspondence course, 
And one of the first letters by him I ever deciphered was written to a recent initiate in his shorthand fraternity. It ends with this formidable sign off, which caused me real headaches to unravel. I'd also been stumped by a similarly baffling amalgamation of consonants coming earlier. With hindsight, contextual clues meant this one should have been easier to work out, but again, I was foxed. So to then come to the brackets immediately afterwards was almost to experience Byram addressing me directly. That bit in brackets, the, the bit underlined in red says, if you cannot read this, as the man said, give it to your neighbours. Reassuringly to his novice pupil, Byram's highlighting that he's using more advanced techniques of contraction of a phrase, not a single word here. It's to be expected it will seem difficult at first. In the act of deciphering, I was that novice, deliberating slowly over the shapes, wondering if a dotting or positioning was significant or irrelevant. I realised what was going on when I'd finally unravelled contraction rules number seven and number 14 from Byram's printed manual. But a manual is a very poor substitute for the shorthand writing neighbours we know his pupil had when he got that letter. And I don't think anyone's made great strides learning shorthand with a manual alone especially if they're not simultaneously learning to write to others in it. As I suggested at the start, Byram's shorthand was informed by 18th century associational culture, something glimpsed in coterie verse like this. He organised several informal clubs for his pupils to foster mutual improvement in writing. The Cambridge Club, for example, went on a fieldwork trip to Trinity Chapel's organ gallery to hone their stenography skills on sermons. And at the Hoop Inn, round the corner in Bridge Street, perhaps behind one of these windows, in fact, the company were very merry guessing words. We know these only from an 1850s longhand transcript of Byram's lost shorthand original. You have to write those words back into shorthand to see why they might be fun to work out. In the same way, you won't quite get the jokiness behind that beg leave to call myself your most obedient humble servant to command sign off unless you see and trace out that shorthand on the page for yourself. My wider point here is about the shortcomings of using transcription alone. Once shorthand turns into longhand print, a sometimes dangerous fixture takes place, especially if the actual shorthand gets forgotten. Classic example is Robert Latham and William Matthews edition of Pepys. They were quite upfront about the tentative nature of much of their transcription, but their edition is invariably quoted as definitive and also as if it's the longhand transcript that Pepys actually wrote. Which brings me to the solution to that challenge at the start. The solution is, what do you think this means? I say the solution because that's what Byram told us it was. But perhaps a solution would be apter. So often with shorthand deciphering, we have multiple possible solutions to weigh up. Future work on them requires building collaborative, sociable approaches if we're to make deeper inroads, not just into deciphering, but more fully exploring shorthand's important place in linguistic and cultural history. That's why I'm excited that the Dickens Code project could foster new ways to reinvigorate interest in obsolete shorthands. Digitalization and machine learning are bringing many advances to areas of paleography and codicology to assist academics in all this. But on a simpler mundane level, don't let's forget a lot begins with the simple pleasures and rewards of collaborative puzzle solving. If you cannot read this, as the man said, give it to your neighbors. Which brings me nicely to another puzzle to do with another fast disappearing media form, postcards. Using shorthand or abbreviations or codes on postcards in the early 20th century was hugely popular. Here's one I've got from 1903 that shows Dickens' birthplace. 
you might make out that it's got some Pittman shorthand on the back. Perhaps the roots of this started over 150 years before. For example, one of Byram's rivals, a stenographer called Orly Macaulay, wrote in the 1750s how using his polygraphy system, gentlemen and ladies may, in the size of a card, communicate their thoughts to each other in a very extensive manner. Claire, Hugo and I thought it might be great to encourage some shorthand deciphering via the Dickens Code website by posting up a few examples of cards from a little collection of such things I've assembled over the years. And I hope some of you out there might help us with their solutions and enjoy solving them too. Thanks very much for listening. And I'm really sorry I can't actually be present at the symposium today, but please feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any questions.